I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken. I'm the chair of the center, and we're delighted you're all with us tonight. Uh, for me, it is truly a great honor uh, and quite a privilege and something enormously exciting to welcome <coughs> Stan Ofshinsky to the UC Berkeley campus for his talk this evening. I have to start on a personal note. I met Stan when the 1960s were just beginning. I was 15. Uh, and Stan, almost from the moment I met him, was the most remarkable person I had ever met. And now, almost five decades later, I would not change that assessment. I would just give myself a little credit for foresight. I'd like to introduce Stan by starting at his home, a warm, beautiful place northwest of Detroit. And in the home, there are quite a few photographs. And I'd like to briefly talk about three of them. One is a photograph with a very warm inscription to Stan by I.I. Rabi, the great physicist at Columbia University, the winner of the Nobel Prize. The second photograph has three serious-looking Mexican peasants standing. If you look closely at the photograph, there is true hope in their eyes. They are watching in the foreground Lazaro Cardenas, arguably the most beloved president of Mexico in the 20th century, signing the land reform decree in the 1930s that transformed Mexico. And the third photograph is a photograph of Stan and Rosa Parks, the heroine of the Civil Rights Movement, having dinner together in Detroit. And I mention these three photographs because they are the three themes with which I want to introduce Stan that run throughout his life and in terms of his work and in terms of what he'll be talking about tonight are so intimately related. They are his scientific brilliance, his social vision, and his moral courage. His scientific brilliance, we're going to have someone give a brief remark on this in a moment, Professor. Uh, Arthur Bienenstock from Stanford University, the president of the American Physical Society, who will say this far better than I could. But I just want to touch on a few points. Stan began his career with pioneering work on automation. He moved on from that to do original, highly regarded work in the treatment of schizophrenia with organic drugs. And a great physicist from MIT, the late David Adler, put it this way. The science and technology of disordered materials has not proceeded down the ordinary path. Stanford Arovshinsky, a self-taught genius who was previously known in scientific circles primarily for his contributions to automation and neurophysiology, began working in the field in 1955, when almost all physicists believed that amorphous semiconductors could not even exist. This field of amorphous semiconductors is a field that Stan pioneered and defined. It is a field that is now an area of physics that's now named after him as ovonics. Many years ago, I.I. Rabi, in 1983, wrote a letter to Stan, which he began, thank you for sending me a copy of your collected papers. They are indeed stunning and monumental. I have watched their growth since a very long time ago. Helmut Fritschek, a professor emeritus of physics at Chicago, for many years the chair of the Department of Chicago, describes Stan's influence 
on physics and particularly this area of physics in the following way. Stan's laboratories had become a mecca for many of us from Stanford, Harvard, MIT, Penn State, and Chicago. Stan attracted the best and we had exciting brainstorming sessions at the big round table of Stan and kept up with the latest ideas and experiments. But defining Ovonics, doing this pioneering work on materials that has so changed the world and will, is the basis of what he will be talking on tonight, was not easy, particularly at the beginning. Mark Kastner, a professor of physics at MIT, the Donner Professor of Science, the dean of the School of Science at MIT, put it this way. A condition of my job offer from MIT in 1973 was that I not work on amorphous semiconductors. This, of course, is the field that Stan pioneered. The, quote, experts, unquote, at Bell Labs had advised MIT that the field had no future. There is no doubt in my mind that were it not for Stan, I would not be where I am today and I will always be grateful. And the remarkable thing about this, remarkable in its own way, under any set of circumstances, is Stan did this pioneering work as a self-taught individual, born and raised in Akron, Ohio, and gives enormous credit for what for some would be postgraduate work at the Akron Public Library at night while he was still in high school. Uh, he and his late wife Iris were named Heroes of Chemistry in 2000 by the American Chemical Society. Uh, they described the award, Heroes of Chemistry, as being made for his significant and lasting contributions to global human welfare. He is a fellow in the American Physical Society, he is a fellow of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science and has won a remarkable number of awards for his science. With this alone, it would be well worth listening to what he has to say tonight. But this brings me to the second theme, his social vision, which has informed this work and why this photograph of the three Mexican peasants and Lazaro Cardenas is so important because it was given to Stan personally by the widow of Lazaro Cardenas in recognition of what his work potentially means for Mexico and for Latin America. The social vision is translated into a focus not simply on the scientific work but on translating this through technologies, which he has worked on engineering, developing, designing, and implementing to produce solar energy, hydrogen, battery power, and memory. On the solar energy front, technologies that allow the mass production of solar energy in the way that you would print newsprint on a newspaper at volume production, which means that it becomes potentially far more widely available. On battery power, the nickel metal hydride battery comes out of Stan's work and is in fact his invention, uh, the battery that powers virtually all commercial hybrids in use today. And one could go on and on, but there has been a focus very conscious in what he has done scientifically and technologically on the creation of jobs, on issues of development, on the social well-being of communities, so that in yesterday's New York Times, there was an article uh, on the front page of the newspaper about two communities in Michigan, one of them going through a trauma because of the closure of the largest refrigerator plant in the United States. And in that same article, counterposed to that, was something that the governor of Michigan has heralded quite widely, which was the company that Stan founded and guided for almost five decades, is building three new solar energy plants in Greenville, Michigan, that will create ultimately 
1,200 jobs. For Stan and his work and his vision, the issues of development, the possibilities of social change, the impact on people and communities is central to his science. And that brings me to the last photograph and the last point, moral courage. Throughout a long career, and no doubt for many years into the future, he has stood alone when necessary, but been willing to stand or sit in defense of the ideals he views as important. Issues of civil liberties, of civil rights, of human rights, of democratic values, inform him as a person, as a citizen, and as a science a scientist. And he really doesn't draw a distinction between these various roles. So when Stan was sitting at that gala dinner with Rosa Parks in Detroit, it wasn't quite so gala when unions were being organized in the 1930s and Stan took a stand. When the civil rights movement was unfolding in the 40s, 50s, and certainly into the 60s, when Stan was very instrumental in what took place in his championing of human rights, civil liberties, and democratic values. He's brought all this together in a remarkable way, beginning a focus on issues of alternative energy in the early 1960s. We know how critical the questions of climate change and the environment are today. Uh, they've never been more critical. To me, looking back, it's remarkable how Stan would have the vision in 1960 to form a company to develop these scientific advances in its laboratories and on its production floors uh, called energy conversion devices that pioneered issues of hydrogen and solar and battery power well before it was on anyone's horizon. Throughout this, Stan has had a very strong optimism but he's also someone who is remarkably realistic. However, in a conflict between optimism and an unfavorable reality, Stan's choice has always been to have the optimism reshape the reality than to let the reality crush what might be. And it's with that uh, that I'd like to, to conclude just by paraphrasing the great uh, American labor leader, Eugene Debs, whose the paraphrase is, the cross is bending, the midnight is passing, and joy cometh with harnessing the sun. So with that, I'd like to introduce Professor uh, Arthur Bienenstock to say a few words about Stan's scientific accomplishments. Thank you, Absolutely. I'm doing this from memory, so don't trust any dates. <laughs> In the mid-60s, Stan had an enormous impact on physics with the announcement of two types of devices. Both involved uh, some conductors, a thin sheet of amorphous material in between. By applying pulses of one sort, he could transform that thin material from a highly resistive material to uh, a highly conducting material. It was known as the threshold switch. It would have a very high resistance until a certain voltage was reached, and then it would switch into a highly conductive state. The second device was a memory device. Again, it involved the switching from a high resistance state to a low resistance state, but this time you could keep it either in the high resistance state or the low resistance state. Those two devices set the field of amorphous semiconductors going. I have to say that at first no one believed 
that one could go back and forth between a high resistance state and a low resistance state as rapidly as Stan was claiming for the memory device. And Stan was also claiming that it was a transition back and forth between a crystalline state in which the atoms are highly ordered and an amorphous state in which the atoms are ordered pretty much like a liquid. That was, Stan was subsequently proven to be right, however, and uh, the field progressed. Soon after that, Stan showed that you could switch these materials with the application of light, and in particular lasers. And most of you in the room profit from that because that's the basis of the CD RWs and DVD RWs that you can read and write on with your computer. Uh, they're all based on that memory material and subsequent advances in memory materials that Stan developed. Stan, at the same time, was making fundamental contributions to the field of amorphous materials and throwing ideas out just left and right. I can recall on a plane with the Nobel laureate Sir Neville Mott, who got his Nobel Prize for working in this field, that he said, a lot of my best ideas came from Stan, who just gave them away to me. Uh, and all of us in the field have had that experience. Not long after that, he started working on amorphous silicon with the plan of making it into photovoltaics. He made fundamental contributions that converted it from a lab phenomenon to something that became commercial ending with uh, production plants in which sheets that wide or wider and a mile or so long contain photovoltaics that you can slice up, put on roofs, put on the walls of buildings as you see them um, in, in many places. Uh, and it dramatically changed the photovoltaic field from something where you powered little uh, calculators to something that could produce lots of power. Uh, I think still in succession now in the 80s, uh, as I recall, Stan uh, developed the electrodes for the nickel metal hydride batteries. And those electrodes are a critical part. Whereas prior to Stan, people were trying to make pure single phase electrode Stan brought this order to the field, um, putting in many elements into the battery so that the crystals were very small, and that allowed the capacity of the batteries to become so high that they could be used uh, for, uh, well, all the nickel metal hydride cells that you have in your computers and the like, but also for automobiles, for the hybrid automobiles. The same ideas went on uh, to advance hydrogen storage in solids, not in gas tanks, and fuel cells. And with that, I think I will quit and leave the floor open to Stan. <laughs> I'm, uh, first of all, hardy to never quit. And the physics community won't let you. He's now, as you heard, president of the American Physical Society. And it's wonderful that he's out there doing the things that also is such a great value to the people in our country and the world. I want to thank, I can't thank Harley and Vicki. I asked Vicki for permission because I guess some people know as beakers, but it, the incredible uh, relationship that Harley and Vicki and I and Iris, my lightweight wife, and what he's done in the world and what has Vicki has done. I remember when she came back from Guatemala and I, and in this case, not like a politician, when there were shots being uh, wrinkled around the places that she went. The 
whole idea of being introduced here at Berkeley by, by Harley is an emotional experience that I really can't do justice without tearing up. And I thank, I, I honored to be here, honored to be involved with Harley and Vicky. Very honored, unexpected. I didn't know that Hardy was coming until, and I didn't know that he was going to uh, say anything. So uh, he's one of my oldest collaborators. And uh, not in age, no, no, no. <laughs> and Roz and he uh, joined us when he was still uh, an assistant professor, I believe, at, at, at uh, you were finished with Harvard, you were at MIT. No, Harvard. I, it's good not to get it too, uh, get it confused, you know. Uh, and I felt I had to, he picked me up in a car one day, I felt I had to hold on to his tailpipe because he liked sport cars, but gee, it was in terrible condition. <laughs> the, uh, the fact is that uh, while I'm standing here, and I'm getting these receptions, and it certainly has been a struggle. I didn't stand on the shoulders of great men I live shoulder to shoulder with great scientists, great people, a culture. I'm proudest of the culture I, ours and I built at ECD, Energy Conversion Devices. Now, I'm not going to be giving a, a really in a lecture. It's going to be a little different because what I really want to do is to make sure, really, uh, by the way, when I say that I, it is not just the people that I worked with were all my colleagues and collaborators. I should tell that as a story because one of my uh, joint ventures in photovoltaics is that the, it was a Japanese company, very good Japanese company, and it was in Mexico, and uh, and then it was and in the United States, and he was um, the president of the company. Came up to uh, one of our my colleagues and collaborators, and everybody was, and said, "Just tell me something, Jeff. I I don't understand this. What? Why? It's obvious you don't." care for me, or whatever it is. And, and what, what did Mr. Oshinsky have, have that I don't have? And he said, well, for one thing, he didn't call us employees like you do. We were his colleagues and collaborators. And for the second thing is, he was never Mr. Oshinsky to any of us. But not one of us thought of calling him anything but staff. And to me, science and technology absolutely is a human, a human activity and must work, no matter what some of your professors may still tell you. It must work. Science must be value-driven. It is not free of values. It must be value. We are all here, I believe, to make a better world. And what I'm going to talk about is that we're facing a crisis, a crisis that if we do, don't do something about, is going to be very destructive, not only to, to you, but to your children and your grandchildren and the planet and forever, because it's irrevocable. A lot of scientists have spoken up and said that within, if we don't do something that changes drastically, the way it's going in, our, in climate change. In 20 years, it'll be irreversible. So it's not a fad to think about the environment. It's not something you do just to make yourself feel that you're doing something right. It's an absolute necessity. And why do I say 
Latin America, when I, I will mention it, but climate change is global and it will change forevermore our planet and there'll be tremendous serious consequences in every way that you might imagine. So it has to be dealt with. You can't wait for historical processes. I'm so glad that I already mentioned the memory. Uh, one of the companies uh, that I work with now is Intel. But in the beginning, they were, they were well, Bob Noyes and Gordon Moore came out to see us, me, and uh, wanted to talk to us because at that time they were still making memory cores by wrapping wires around them for computers. And, and I just read recently, and I'm saving it, the head of the memory group at Intel said uh, that my face changed memory, which I hope you'll hear more of because it is really exploding now, is the nearest thing to Nirvana. Now, I've never been to Nirvana, but I feel so good because the struggle that we went through, I'd rather not describe. In any case, in any case, uh, what I'd like to do then is to say, I'm not going, the reason I'm, it's not going to be a lecture. I really want a lot of time for questions and discussion and answers. But there are problems and they've been misrepresented and there are great people in the newspapers and generally in politics who make the mistake, and it has got to be an, honor, an honorable mistake, that you can't do anything about energy unless you have a new Manhattan project. And that the problems, and they all write beautifully about the problems with great um, unrelish about how horrible it's going to be. And, and Vice President Gore, who I knew very well, knew him when he was a congressman, knew him, we went to Russia together when he was the vice president. And I, and I think he deserves his Nobel Prize, so it's not criticism, except to wish the hell that he had done, and Clinton, another great fellow, had done something about it when they were in office. So why I'm saying that is that scientists alone will not solve this problem, unless all of you understand what the problem is, and there is solutions, and they're not 10 years away, 20 years away, but now. But in order to make that statement, I'm, not go I'm only going to identify the problems. And then I'm going to show you the data. As someone said last night, it's, I guess it's one of my things I always used to tell everybody, including myself, in God we trust, everybody else shows data. So when you make great claims, when, when you make great claims, you better have great proofs. Now, that it isn't going to show, I'm not showing you utopia, because science and technology isn't like that. It's something that is in development. Rosa Oshinsky now has always told me that, well, this is where we are now. And I say to Rosa, but that we can't be there. We must move forward. And she's done so much for us in the hydrogen work and, and everything that we worked on. And I w wish I could tell every, uh, give everybody's name, but I, I just want to tell you, it's been great joy for me in where we're going. The struggle has been painful. The joy of doing it. One of my friends, Vicky Weisskopf, in MIT, once wrote a book, The Joy of Science. It makes it all worthwhile as long as it fits in that we are, we are doing what we have to do to make, to solve what we started a company in 19, January 1st, 1960, to use science and technology to solve serious societal problems. So I'd like to have, and I'm, if I 
press the wrong button, do I? You just, it, but it's to the, I'm supposed to go to the right, and I find that pretty hard to do. Um, I, this is from, uh, this is from the uh, punch, which many of the younger generation probably haven't heard of, but it was a, a great journal and probably still being published in England. And it shows uh, King Cole and King Steen, Steen and looking at each other and uh, being very upset by that little child. You can't hardly read it. It says electricity uh, around his head like a, and he's uh, having a storage of force. And uh, it's like it's an instrument, the way he's holding it. The prescient thing about it is Edison had only invented the life bulb one year earlier. So the artist was really somebody we should respect. And as you know, the whole world depended in early days of industrialization on wood. And then in England, when wood ran out, they, the dark, the dark hills of England, there was even darker because they went to coal. Fossil fuel, which was always there for so many years in one form or another, suddenly became the dark satanic mills. It became a terrible thing. And what we want to do is to show you that that was science, that was technology, that was the start of the industrialization of, of our world. And there was something different, something that was called electricity. Electricity is in whatever form it is, solar, whatever. It's electrons. Now, I think this is kind of evident to the audience and obvious, but it's no longer something that we can just wait for somebody to solve. What you saw there were King Cole, King Steam. King Cole is still very much in, in our lives. But we also have, I'd hate to say, King Oil. Uh, kings sometimes were democratic. I won't go further on that right now. <laughs> Pollution, climate change gases, and wars over oil. That's not a slogan that we put up just in Berkeley. That's a fact. Japan went to war, the Second World War. And I knew it when as soon as the United States cut off its oil supply. The nations, no matter what we do in the future, it's going to be Orwellian warfare. That means a continuous wars over how to get oil because it's a lifeblood of energy. So we're going to be not only a past, the sailors that were on that ship in Yemen some years ago that was had a big hole in it, they weren't there. They weren't there to get a suntan. They were there, and we hear about trillions of dollars, but those, those were days when you spent that, that was yet to come because they were protecting the straits there. They were protecting oil. And the United States and China, China argues with Japan still about some oil things, but it's going to be drastic in the future. No country is going to be untouched by our dependence upon the thing that's murdering the planet. Nothing. So it's wars. It has to do with some things that's happening in the deindustrialization of our country, which I'll talk about. And the atomic, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is, if you, if you don't read it, you ought to support it and get it, has 
made it a point on their uh, doomsday clock, where they set it closer and closer to doomsday by virtue of the danger to the planet from atomic warfare. And this time, this last year, they made climate change to be almost the equivalent of atomic warfare that would absolutely devastate the planet and humanity. Now, yeah, that I say I write now for the purposes of honesty. That is black hair. <laughs> and that's Iris there. And we started with the idea that we had to do something about a problem that no one thought was a problem. The reason we meant uh, we made the company Energy Conversion, and I'll explain why I'm not now still with Energy Conversion in a moment, it is because to me, information and energy are the twin pillars of our global economy. And to me, information is encoded energy. So I went to the blackboard. That's a real blackboard, by the way. Um, that's Iris. And I was showing what had to be done in terms of, the, of starting with the funniest thing in the world, in a way. You're, you're decoupling when you use hydrogen and you use the sun. You're really decoupled completely from fossil fuel. You're coupled to the Big Bang, to the beginning of the universe, because hydrogen was the first out of the, uh, out of the, to, uh, to arrive with the, with, the exp with the Big Bang, and almost all matter is made of it that we know of, and it, of course, is the most common element in the universe. And what I was showing there, that we had to start with the sun. We had to have hydrogen that we could break apart and uh, the molecule and get the atoms. We had to be able to recombine them, have electrodes. And if you think it was an exercise in just, uh, I don't mind being called a visionary, but I'm not a dreamer. It was that because everything I do, I have to show. I have to show it and prove it. I demand that of everybody else, and I show an example. And I would, that's hydrogen, and the same day you can see the blackboard. And I was doing actually a very important experiment with it. But we started with the, we started with the sun. At a time when, of course, nobody believed that, that I thought that was something that was, had to be a bit off, to say the least. Well, here we are. I don't. This is where we are now. It's still a work in progress, and it'll always be a work in progress. Beyond my generation, beyond your generation, change is inevitable, and how to change it in a positive manner is absolutely a necessity. So instead of something on the blackboard, there is an actual product in every one things that you see. There's over a billion uh, nickel metal hydride consumer batteries made every year. Uh, there's uh, uh, hybrid, ele uh, hybrid electric cars. There's photovoltaic buildings, which we'll talk about. There's uh, uh, internal combustion engines running on hydrogen. There is large size hydrogen so in a solid. All of it is in the solid. The battery has hydrogen ions going back and forth and stores hydrogen in a solid as well. And so you start with the sun again. Why the sun? I know that this is ridiculous to talk to people in Berkeley about. But you have to remember that the sun is fusing hydrogen that after the Big Bang happened, hydrogen diffused as gases throughout the universe and condensed into suns. And our sun, our sun, 
operates and gives us the photons of light that we use for photovoltaics by fusing, by fusing hydrogen. That's the energy source for all this. So you're decoupled from fossil fuels, and you're coupling now to the beginning of the universe, and you cannot go before that, I don't think. If, unless Sal per Permut is here, I don't think so. Maybe he can do that in the, the new physics that's about to come. In any case, there are batteries. You have to store electricity. There's a fuel cell, which I won't spend a lot of attention on, it's, although it's very important. I just mentioned that the internal combustion engine, we have uh, Prius, Priuses, as we'll show you, running the, the battery-enabled electric and hybrid vehicles, the hydrogen internal combustion engine with our batteries, of course, and the Prius, which is standard. We took out the, uh, the gas tank and put in and put in uh, solid, our solid hydrogen. As I said, Rosa was very instrumental in that. And we uh, ran around and got one of our technicians who was a colleague, because we don't, shouldn't say technicians as if they're people they're below our status. There's no one below our status. Um, in any case, in any case, he drove, drove, drives, drove it back to work, which was very far away every day. And he would get 200 mile range on, a, on our first attempts. And we were up to going 250 and 300. And at that point, high pressure hydrogen was doing about 80 miles at the very best. And so we made reality out of hydrogen as a fuel. And then you'll see the other, uh, the, those tubular forms, we'll look at them more later. There's storage for hydrogen, which beyond transportation is stored electricity when you put it in a solid. There's never been stored electricity before. If there was a little kid, nowadays you'd just say that you, you have stored electricity. And we show that in the future, how you can use hydrogen fuel to also get clean water and so on. So that loop proves that right now, everything you see there is something that works, that is uh, either being introduced or has already been years of, of activity, commercial activity. And anything that burns, which is coal, gas, oil, wood, anything can now be replaced. Fossil fuel can start being replaced. Now, not 50 years from now, as I'll show you, but now. And the process better be accelerated. And that's why I no longer, when I retired from energy conversion devices, I didn't retire from the world. I didn't retire retire from the values that we have. I just wanted to be able to not to do anything incremental of what I've done, but to do the absolute necessary thing to have a habitable uh, planet. And that, that is to make fossil fuels be challenged without any, it doesn't matter what you think about it. You'll change from it to the economic process of, uh, of having available to you a fuel and storage media that replaces uh, fossil fuels. Because when you do that, when you do that, you change the entire equations of energy if you can do away with fossil fuel and oil. It's a world planet revolution, really. And we'll talk, talk about it. But I wanted you to see the reality. Many th thousands of people have actually driven the cars and actually seen it and actually 
things of that sort. Now, Harley, do you, do you draw the card? I certainly did. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, it was in Berkeley that there was, UN had a big meeting and uh, on energy and I was asked to be, uh, give a big talk. And uh, one of the people who was on a panel later on who had written a book about hydrogen being booked or something like that. Uh, the chairman had asked me if I would be on the panel later on. So I thought everybody had heard my talk, you know, how you feel when you get all prepared. And this fellow got up and said, you can't have hydrogen, you can't drive it, it can't be done. And the chairman who had visited us and driven the car says, that's a damn lie, I drove it. So that's the only way you're going to win and you're going to win because you have to have the economy choose not whether we believe in fossil fuels or we believe in hydrogen. We ha if we make it competitive, if we make hydrogen competitive, the fossil fuel, then everything will change because of the economics involved. People will not make their decision on their prejudice. They'll make it because of their pocketbook. That's a damn shame. But that's how we're going to have to make sure that the world changes. Um, there's a, uh, oh, by the way, it's not that I'm trying to destroy the oil, oil companies or anything of the sort. I've always tried to be a resource everywhere I've gone and not a destroyer. But hydrogen is the ultimate fuel, and the oil companies used to say that. I guess maybe Shell still does, or are companies who recognize it. But they proposed, they proposed that, and this is, the, this is when, uh, if you put the industrialization of the United States on there, or for that matter, the world, you start with wood, it's carbon-based, and you're, and the amount ratio with hydrogen, and you go on to less and less carbon. And carbon, by the way, and everybody should understand this because we have to be simple about it. Carbon in, the, in gasoline is just holds hy hydrogen. It is the means for hydrogen to be released in combustion. The carbon itself is, can cause cancer and everything else that's bad. We don't need the carbon. Why not go directly to hydrogen? So Shell felt it was their civic uh, duty to uh, do something very nice because you can see the data. But they put it out there uh, at least uh, somewhere in, starting in the 50 years from now. It wasn't a Saint, a Saint Aquinas who said uh, about, uh, about his, you know, they wanted everybody to, you know, not have sex. And he said, yes, he, he agreed, good Lord, but not now. And that's the way these companies are. Yes, we'll do that, but not now. We can't afford not now. We can't wait for 50 years. It's too late, way too late. And remember that the carbon is what causes the problem. But it's the hydrogen that is the solution. So don't use anything, whether whatever it is, that holds the hydrogen that you have to leave as a waste product. This is probably one of the most important things that I can show you. And it's not my data. And uh, it is the data from uh, Caltech and uh, an, Argon, an Argon laboratory. And this says it all, because everybody said, well, we'll use, we'll use wind, we'll use tidal, we'll use, and of course, biofuels and so on. And they did the scientific thing. 
and they analyzed it beautifully well done. And they published it. In fact, the fellow who was working on it preceded one of my talks. He said, I don't know anything about solar, but I can tell you, and I don't want to give it away right now. But if you take wind, and you, in order to, uh, to maintain the CO2 uh, uh, levels, and you can read it yourself, below 550 parts per million by the year ppm, and the amount of energy that each contributes. You can see what wind is two to four, tidal is two, hydro is 1.6, biofuels. And this is a figure that you should know that if you used all the United States land that is usable to, uh, to grow biofuels, that you would still only have 12% 12, 12 of, of the country's uh, transportation needs, forgetting about all the pollution and everything. 12%, and with diesel, 7%. So you go to the geothermal, and you can see you're nowhere near. You're, no, you're nowhere near where you, where you can be. In fact, the, one of the authors of the paper went something like this. says, if you do all that, you're like this. There's only one thing. I know nothing about it, he said at the time. But it's the sun. The sun is the only source that can give us the energy, more than the energy, in fact, in, in one day, the sunshine on the planet is enough uh, for the entire, uh, more energy than you need for a year. So this means that you must have, and the solution is, you must have uh, use solar, and you and must have, if you use solar intermittent, any energy uh, for, uh, source that's intermittent, you must have storage. It's a big problem. We'll talk about it. Um, this is the first, not the first machine, but the first commercial machine. We uh, shipped it to, uh, we, we shipped it to Japan because America wasn't interested, I would have been very happy. And I just have to tell you an antidote, but it's really uh, very important. At our house, we had a very, we were a small group, and uh, this was in the late 70s. And uh, people were talking about photovoltaics of that size and making huge claims about it. So I called our little group together, and uh, we had the house, in our house, and I said, well, my friends and colleagues, collaborators, you know what we're gonna do? That's nonsense. We're gonna make it by the mile. And one of the fellows was vice president of one of our companies today, it just came from Rochester, New York, East McCovac. And he and his wife, as they walked out, I could hear them. They didn't know I could hear them say, this guy's crazy. Let's go back to Rochester. <laughs> and it was, it sounded crazy. And the only correction I can say, Artie, is that uh, we don't, this is the present machine. It's 30 megawatts, and it, we each roll is, uh, there's six rolls, each roll is one and a half miles. So we do nine miles in a single run. Nine miles in a single run. That machine, I still get chills because I'm a machine builder. I was a machinist and a tool maker as a kid and built machines. And this is, is larger, a little larger than a football field. And it's not empty on purpose. It runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
with very high yields. And this might bore others, but to anybody in engineering and manufacturing. And was much, it was much lower downtime than we had uh, put down in our, in our calculations. Very, very small downtime. And this was so successful, nobody in our company believed in it. I suffered the slings and arrows of outraged fortune in the company and outside of it. They said it couldn't be. I mean, why don't you do, go from five to seven or 10? You know, because I wanted to prove something. That if you don't do it in an industrial basis, then you, you're, you, you are not a, a visionary. You're, you're, a, not, you're not a dreamer. You're not a visionary. That, that machine was supposed to not work. As you can see below there, there is many more going and are in operation, and many more that will be going in. Now, the last line has to be paid attention to. So I left ECD by virtue of retirement, and I want to start, and I started a new company. And that company is called Oshinsky. They were, I wasn't allowed to use any of the other names, but they couldn't take my name away. So uh, Oshinsky, um, you mentioned. Say it louder. Because I figured, well, how? You know, that's what I am. That's what it is. It's, we, should, we could use it. We could use Oshinsky Innovation. And, uh, and why did I do it? Because in order for them, everybody now was talking about a gigawatt. When I started, they were thinking, no, no, I'd like you to have a, a megawatt. But <laughs> the reason is that you have to have gigawatts if you're going to make an impression on energy. In fact, more, you know, terawatts. And so, what I wanted to do was to build a machine that's no larger than that machine, that instead of it being 30 megawatts, because if you get to a gigawatt that way, you have to put a lot of money in, billions of dollars, billions of dollars. And when you get there, you'll have spent a lot of money that Wall Street might help you on or may not. But we ought to be able to do it in one machine in the same size, one gigawatt to replace, say, 30, uh, 30 megawatts and make it a reality. Because when you get to the gigawatt stage, you will be competitive. We will be competitive with fossil fuel. And since I felt I know I can do that, I set up our company again with Rosa. And that's what we're going to do as part of it. I'll show you some of the other parts of the problem, but it won't be this. We'll be competitive to fossil fuel by utilizing the sun. It's, to me, it's like being a machine builder. It's, I still get chills even looking at it because it's like a cathedral might be to the artisans of the past. It's a thing of beauty to me. And this is what it does. These are the... These are the six rolls, each one a mile and a half. And what you see are very, is thin film. People now talk about uh, nanostructure. I, I hate to say I, but that's it. I have been doing nanostructures since the 50s. And that machine that you saw there, and I told you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, high yield, that machine has nine active layers, three of which, and altogether, they are less than a half a micron thick on the film. And, and three of those films, instrumental for its operation, are under 100 angstroms. Continuous production, not something you write letters to physical review, letters or something like that. It is nanostructures 
with the unusual uh, chemistries because that's something I won't talk about because I'll be going too long. Th this is a very old thin film device, thinner than that is, and it's been used on the, this film like this was used on the uh, space, uh, st the Russian space station, and they took, they took, not this one, but they took it down and sent it to us as a souvenir before they let it go. And you can't do that to conventional material. You can't do that to crystal material. This material is disordered and it's amorphous. And it has nothing to do with campuses and disorder. It is scientifically used for the degrees of freedom, for the degrees of freedom of going to the totalitarian use of crystals, which many of you young people use and think about, is that you have to have periodicity and you can't do anything to it or it's no good. And so I give it new degrees of freedom. What do you need to do? Just take away that and take away the totalitarianism of the crystalline lattice. That's not a good thing to use in scientific literature, but I do it occasionally. So uh, it's flexible. Uh, I, uh, th those of you who've seen me do it or been around, I have to use drill presses now. I, we, I used to shoot bullet holes through these to show you because if you get the edge, you get the edge of a heavy breakable crystalline material, which you have to do something to your roofs in many cases to use them, then you've lost everything. That isn't so here. I just wanted to show you that if you're going to change the world, you have to meet it head on, reality, you must give it the reality. Being able, this is how it looks on a building. The, no newspaper stories needed to say, uh, you know, this, uh, this material is ugly, we, as they do with the, some of the others. This is, you, you make a thin film and buy the miles, you lay it down, it's adhesive, and the roof may come off if you had a hurricane. You never get the photovoltaics off. So that's in California. And you could see there's a little bit of, of uh, haze in the background. And that's, of course, what California is trying to do something about. But it's pretty. To me, it's pretty. Architects like it for other reasons. I won't, I'll just quickly. There's a roof. It just looks like any other good roof. It's photovoltaics. It's generating electricity. This is uh, in Germany, where the uh, aesthetics were important to them. And they have the River Rhine running in front of there. They said, can we use your films to make it like a river? Well, th that blue stuff there is our films. And yes, sir, aesthetically, to me anyway, they're beautiful. Uh, Solar wind, as I mentioned, is, is not synchronized with uh, load demands if you're in utility. We have to be utility. So batteries, I've mentioned, solid hi hydrogen permits you to be used for both utilities and transportation. And for the first time ever, you have, you have stored electricity. These are the batteries, they're plug and play. These are the cars, and those of you who've seen the crushing of them, the EV1. And that truck went up Pikes Peak and made it pure electric. And, and the uh, reporters asked him, what did it feel like? He said, I don't know, I ran out of mountain. The, that, that's in Italy, been going around and around in Rome. And the amount of pollution you save is extraordinary. And of course, the, you have the uh, hybrid cars and even scooters and so on. I just want, and it's plug and play, you just like photovoltaics. We have plug wiring. We don't, you plug it in and you have 
your electric energy. And now, what I'm trying to say, as best I can, is that you now have answers to these problems, actual things that work, scientific, scientific uh, materials, atomically engineered, that's why I call them scientific. You don't live with just one element or the other. You can design the neutrinos and the batteries. There's at least seven different elements. And take away the, what people say can't be done. There's a hydrogen station that's mobile, and you can make an industry out of that, just like you do prefabricated homes. And there you don't have, people say, well, the infrastructure is going to be large, too, too much money. There's a dispenser as well. Everything you see there, then, is part of bulk hydrogen for utilities. On board, that's what in some of the uh, hydro, uh, hydrogen hybrids. And these are what the cars look like. They drive just like any other car. By the way, that's the Toyota. They didn't know that that tent was our photovoltaic. And that car on top was taken by a company and crushed because it was successful. And now the economics. I'm almost done. The economics, that you can see that's a pretty old slide. I'd say it's about five years old. And, and yet, the company that, uh, the utility that uh, used nighttime electricity, which doesn't, which is very cheap, and made it hydrogen and was selling it at that price means that you truly can be competitive to, uh, to, to gasoline, no matter what you've heard or what you've read. You can put it anywhere, the side of the road. It's electricity. So what is needed? I just think you, new technology, new science. That's why I'm working so hard with my small group of collaborators and colleagues. And, and instead of having an exponential curve for, to get to the gigawatt stage, one machine, one machine for very little money will solve the problem. That's what I'm working on. I think that uh, I can't take any more time, and, but I, I think you ought to realize that from what Harley said, having building new industries is an absolute necessity for this century. The ones that we have, and they're getting smaller and smaller, the deindustrialization of this country is a crime. You need to have new science, new technology that provides higher value opportunities for the young people and the unemployed and feeds back on the educational system. We now have been for years writing curricula for some of the colleges and universities so that they can keep up with the new science. I, I don't think I need to discuss this. Uh, I think it's pretty evident from my talk. I'd like to discuss this only because not because, by the way, I showed it in all my presentations. It isn't because I wanted to end by really talking about Latin America. That, I'll tell you the story in a moment, but I, I'll just say again something that happened to me years ago. I was invited to Venezuela. By the way, the president of MIT by accident came because we had mutual friends. I was invited by the, uh, develop, the research and development arm of the government. And um, they asked me the question of, uh, you know, what should we do with our oil money? And I made myself very unpopular because I pointed to the hillsides or the, sh or the, sh the huts, if you want to call them that, 
where the poor live and where the streets with beggars and unemployed and they were getting all the raking in in those years a lot of money like they're still trying to do and i said well the answer is your future is in those hills if you don't take that money now and build new industries that have value the, you, you, you won't be able to live when those hills, those people up there come down to you. And you ought to think of what they're going through while you're spending all the money that you are really not using it to build your, your country. And so this is in uh, Mexico. And she, this young lady, practically a girl, she, please note that she's barefooted. She's walking up a mountain that a goat can't get up. She's carrying the future on her back. It's an old picture. Future on her back to electrify her village because there's no electricity. There's, it's, it's gathering society. The men have left to go north. And she's got the future on her back, and she's got the future in front of her. I used to say that that child will go to school. That child and children like that have gone to the universities. So what I'm telling you that I would like to talk more about the Latin America, but it's a common problem. Everywhere, oil is disruptive, whether it's in Russia, where they use it for gigantic personal expenditures and, and political control, whether it's in any of the countries that are, have the curse of oil on them. And yet we need it. We need the energy. So we have to replace it. And to do that, it's going to count on all of you, not just me, not just my collaborators, all of you. Because without going up that mountain with that young lady, and bringing in a future that's better, unbelievably better, then we're doomed. And I'm not a doomsayer. Everybody knows I'm an optimist. But we're facing deep problems, and we need everybody's, everybody's help. Thank you so much. questions or brief comments. Uh, I know Stan would very much like to address any issues or questions that you have. My name is uh, Christian Millette. Um, I'm a biomechanical engineer and a marine biologist. Um, I'm really impressed with what you've come up with. These seem to be solutions that seem to work. Uh, which uh, some people have criticized solar panels as being unsustainable, that they take more energy to produce than they'll actually yield. Would you like a figure? I can tell you right now. It well, takes seven months to get your energy back as against seven years and other, other ways of making it. That's extremely impressive. Um, uh, what, the way I see it, though, um, you, you were talking about biofuels. You were talking about carbon being bad. And actually, I see that as the solution because I see carbon as a, a very efficient molecule for, um, or an atom, well, for storing stuff. It has four bonding points. We wouldn't um, have a planet if we didn't have carbon, well, right? The way, what I really like is um, algae fuel because algae is a unicellular uh, plant that reproduces highly efficiently and it's half 50% oil by weight. Um, I don't think that they factored that into their biofuel results because, I mean, using algae with something like a hydrogen fuel cell reformer to power a fuel cell is one of the few solutions I see that would be efficient enough to power everything in this planet. You're right, but there's only two problems, and I hate to be the one that brings reality. There isn't a fuel cell. Fuel cells were raised. I mean, I have one. I'm not going to talk about it. They, but 
the fuel cell was, uh, was in California used when they did away with the, uh, the, the activities for uh, hydrogen and, and batteries, electric vehicles and so on at the time. Uh, that we're going to, one of the auto companies says, don't wait. We're, I mean, just we'll come forth with fuel cells. You don't need to do anything now and so on. So fuel cells are not here commercially. They're not going to be quick enough. And if it's not invented now, and by the way, platinum, I have mine just without platinum or palladium for a catalyst and no expensive membrane. But I'm going to talk about that. Because if it isn't ready now, then all the claims in the world isn't going to be useful. I look upon this as an urgent problem. In terms of carbon, I use it all the time myself for other things. I think there's some lovely scientific work going on with carbon and semiconductors and in other areas. And certainly, I would recommend that the government puts money in, into the algae. And I've said that publicly all over. It's a, why? Not because it's going to be ready in time, but it's a very exciting and interesting possibility uh, and should be part of the research uh, design of our country for meeting the problem. But isn't going to, by so many years, that in 1960, I invented the, the, that phase change material. Just now, it's exploding all over. If you, you do the arithmetic, the planet can't, can't do that anymore. So you're right. You've got good taste. And if, you're, if, that's, if that's what you're interested in, it really is a good way of doing a PhD and so on. But I've always believed in our people that you do your PhD and then you forget you've done it. Yeah, uh, Mr. Oshinsky, uh, uh, yeah, you're a real hero. Stan, Stan. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stan, you're a real hero to us. Um, we drive two of electric vehicles that you made possible. And, um, you know, one is charging. One is charging here in the Center Street Garage. And, um, you know, there is not a public charger here at Berkeley uh, for these cars. No. So uh, just wanted to say thank you for letting us drive zero emissions for the last seven years. We have outlasted the technical specifications that Toyota put on our RAV4 EVs. And um, that's about it. Thank you. You gave, you gave me chills. I can only thank you. It's you and people like you who have become part of a movement that, that has to succeed. And I want to thank you for it. Hi. Um, Hi, um, my name is Bill Kenny. I want to thank you for the work you did with Bob Graham through EPRI on the plug-in hybrids, because I used to deal with Bob. And um, I had the EV1 before it was so graciously given back. But on the part of the solar, because I now teach PV installation, um, do you feel that the infrastructure for the um, inverters and such, that that's basically reach its saturation on the efficiency for the inverters and things like that? Because once that system's in, that's in, you can always change to a more facilicon or any of the next great parts that come to it. And I like the part that you can go with the thin film technologies in the future, but you have the regular single crystalline, multi crystallines, whatever. And then also for distributed generation, because I know they were doing in California the school projects, but it just dried up. And to me, I feel that's where it should be on, you know, parking lot garages, things like that, where it's distributed to help relieve the grid in the off peak hours. Yes, no? Well, first of all, and uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, and I certainly uh, worked uh, to help get the plug-in uh, movement going. But my son here, my oldest son, is doing more for that working with the University 
California Davis uh, activities that are now uh, being made into a company. And uh, I, think, I think that uh, California, despite all the things we might complain about, is still the leading state, the leading place in the United States for really trying to do something about the problems of pollution and climate change. So I, I hear what you say. I'm all for, for your, what you're doing. But we, let's not demonize anybody. Well, there's a few that I would. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mad at the people who crush cars and things. But I want to be a resource to them and not anything else. The, 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 it's because it's beyond us. If we don't, there's hundreds of thousands of people, millions, that are unemployed and going to be unemployed. And uh, I believe that we have to provide a living society that lives up to its humanity. And I think California has been doing a great job. It's, like the San Francisco movement that allows for sanctuary and things of that sort. Stan, uh, my name is Ken Wee. I met you in uh, Detroit and I'm back here. Uh, I'm from Singapore. I just want to publicly say this is that I'm the epiphany why I'm here today. Uh, up to November last year, I was employed with a semiconductor firm uh, doing semiconductor manufacturing. I have three patents pending on the asset optimization for near-zero white space. For four years, my friend here was telling me about electric cars and uh, renewable energy and sustainable energy, and I didn't believe a single word that he said. Not until I sat in a Toyota RAV4 EV, and uh, it has a nickel metal hydride battery of it. I came in November, came back in December for EV EVS 23. I since then quit my job, and I'm here full time, supporting the movement of what you said in uh, very well said in the uh, who killed the electric car at the deleted skin with your wife. We are all here to make this a better world. And there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I saw I, I was saw him, and I was looking for you who was next. Thank you. We have time, unfortunately, for two more questions. I just want to thank you. Also, I have a Chevy S10 pickup that has your batteries from Ovonix in it. Uh, it was made by General Motors, and it runs beautifully, and I power it with solar energy, and I'm totally carbon-free in my transportation, and I just want to thank you so much. I, thank you. <laughs> thank uh, you. Before we go to our last question, I want to thank, just for a moment, the people from the Center for Latin American Studies who worked so passionately to put this event together. I'd like to begin with Beth Perry, who was our program coordinator for this, Sarah Lamson, our vice chair, uh, Greg Luden, uh, our, our technical person on the web, Dionisia Ramos, uh, our business manager, Jackie Sullivan. Uh, and have I missed anyone? Carlota? and Morena. Uh, everyone really with the small staff at the center uh, put real, real energy and, and, and passion into putting this together. So we have time for. <laughs> we have time for one more comment or question. So, uh, you know, it sounds like there are all these testimonials to you, and you seem like this great linear combination between Daniel Berrigan and Buckminster Fuller. 
which was some, it's just something that I've been trying to figure out. So thank you for that. But the question for you, Stan, is a technical one. What's your opinion on these photoelectrochemical uh, solar cells, these dye-sensitized Gretzel cells? I know uh, Gretzel was here a couple weeks ago, and apparently they've got a plant in Wales that they're churning these out at large scales. So what's your feeling as a technologist about how the amorphous thin film solar compares to the dye sensitized as far as ultimate scalability or ultimate utility? Well, I, uh, any, anything that people want to do should be encouraged. There's no one road to Mecca. And I think that if you want to do that. But I will not answer it personally. I'll let someone who is not here now, he's died several years ago. It, when I first knew him, he was Sir George Porter. He had won a Nobel Prize in the uh, 50s, actually. He became Lord, uh, Sir, Lord George Porter. A really a down-to-earth, wonderful guy, and he came to visit me. And uh, years ago, and he came to convince me that uh, what I should be doing, Stan, with all due deference, he said, please go and do it photochemically. That's how nature does it. I've just come back from India where I've been preaching it. I said, well, let's discuss it after you've seen what we do and then see what, you, what your opinions are. He, he uh, really, uh, a very deep thinker, had all the right attitudes. And when he came back and apologized and said, no, you're right, but it didn't, I just thought nature should, would do it better than any of us. And I said, well, now let's take airplanes. We want to be like birds and we want to go like this. Or that's nature's way. Or do we want to build something that flies and can change the world? And that's exactly about photochemistry. With dyes, whatever way you can, the efficiencies are very limited. And nature does it in about 1.5% efficiency at best. We've got to go uh, to the beyond the teens eventually uh, in terms of efficiency. But does that mean that you shouldn't support it and do it, everything should be done as you want to do it and follow your own visions. I won't do anything that's un unrealistic. I'm a very, I'm a very conservative revolutionary. I, we need it done, we need it done, we need it done right now, let's do it. Thank you all for coming and look forward to seeing you at future Center for Latin American Studies events.